What has to happen in the first 10 minutes of a horror screenplay? I think it depends on the genre and what you're trying to accomplish. But I think certainly there should be something that happens in that first 10 minutes that makes an audience realize, holy crap, I'm in for a ride. Something has to happen in that first 10 minutes that gives you that feeling. And if that doesn't happen, I, I, I will oftentimes wonder what we are waiting on. That's just like some, uh, a friend of mine, he, he gets onto me because uh, he, he's way bigger film and TV buff than I am. And he always says to me like, oh, you stopped watching the TV show too soon. It, it got really good on the fifth episode. And I'm like, then why did they wait until the fifth episode? Do it from the beginning. I do this for a living, you can do it. <laughs> do it from the beginning. I think it works the same way with, with horror films. If in the first 10 minutes you've you've not told the audience what kind of ride they're on, then you, in my book, you haven't succeeded. In my book, you're setting yourself up to fail. So in the first 10 minutes, give them something. Give them something to realize, holy crap, something's about to go down. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a gory scene. It's just maybe a sense of mystery, a sense of something ominous that's looming. Yeah. I just I mean, give them some, that's why I say it depends on the, on the type of film that it is, because there can be, it can be a film that is gonna make you feel so uncomfortable. So they give you something at the beginning to let you know like what's happening or what the stakes are or something. Something that really pulls you in and, and lets you know like, I really need to, to keep watching this film. If you haven't given them the hook, like what's gonna pull them in? I don't, I don't know what you're doing really. And that goes really not even just for, for horror films, but films in general. I think you should give somebody some indication of, of what kind of ride they're on. Is it gonna be the, the Disney teacups that spin around? Is it gonna be you know, Space Mountain? What kind of ride are we on, you know? So with 70s and 80s horror, you think we took our time really making it a little more eerie, a little more suspenseful? I think people cared more. There is, there's this thing that happens when you shoot film where everybody goes, hey, this is serious, you know? And I feel that's lost now. I feel like people say, you know, if we don't get it right, we'll get it again, we'll do it again, and we'll do it again, and we'll do it again. Nobody takes it really as serious. But even right now, if you tell somebody we're shooting 35 millimeter film and you show up and you plop down the film camera, everybody goes, hey, hey, this is serious. And everybody starts taking it way more serious. I don't know what it is about a film camera that makes everything more serious, but it does. And I think back then that was all you had. You only had film. It was just what kind of film you're gonna shoot with, but you only had film. And so everybody took everything very serious. And, and then too, if you were a small production, you had a limited amount of film. Most of the time you were shooting with a bunch of short ends, whatever, it was very serious and it was very well thought out and nothing was shot in an extraneous sense. Nothing was shot just in case. Everything was shot with a purpose. And uh, you know, I, I think we're missing that today. Is that why you love the 80s horror genre? Oh, I love it for so many reasons, but that's one of them. That's one of them. Um, I certainly, I, I felt there was a magic in the 80s. You know, and I, I felt, I mean, it came in at the late 70s as well, but, but there was just a certain magic with the 80s and the way the films entertained while still taking it all very seriously and, and still really focusing on, on the creative and technical aspects, but just really putting that production value out there, making it feel magical, making it feel special. Um, I, I, I feel like that's, that's something that I, I've carried with me in, in, in all of my films, trying to make something special, always. Even when it's a shoestring budget, I try to find some sort of way. Are there five 80s horror films or late 70s horror films that you think every horror filmmaker should watch? Like, <laughs> you know, Salem's Lot or, or you know, just any of these Stephen King um, films? I mean, I, my favorite is one that you know, when people hear it, they kind of go, what is that? But uh, Evil Dead Trap, I think everybody should see that. I, I want to say it was, I don't know when that one came out. I know it was in the mid to late 80s. And it is a completely insane horror film from Japan. 
And it was at a time when those movies were banned, especially ones that were this, that depicted violence and gore to this extent. I mean, this guy went hardcore, okay? And I remember seeing that in, where did I see that film? I don't even know where I saw it. It's such, such a rare film. I forget where I saw it, but I fell in love with it immediately. And I've watched it, I don't know how many times. I had to buy it. And the only way you could buy it in the US was part of a, a big pack of films where it was Evil Dead Trap, because that's the only one I really, really watch. And then it was another one called like Entrails of a Virgin. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, they're so bizarre, but yet you could tell when the film is made, it's made with love. This guy loved the genre. He loved, this was before gore gross out was a thing. Before, you know, gore, it was, you know, people think about like the mutilator, that movie, and which not a great movie, but the thing about it was, was, you know, it had some decent gore and the positions that they put people in, even when it didn't show it, when it was just implied, you were like, ah, you know, um, but nobody had taken it to the extent that this guy did. You know, I think his name is, what is it? Toshi, Toshiharu Ikeda is his name. And uh, the, the visuals of that movie are just so disturbing. Um, but I, I look at that film as being my top horror film. Uh, ones that influenced me, yes. Now, if you start getting into others that people should see, do you mean like top horror, or top just films in general? Top horror. Top just because horror? It just seemed like there was a creepiness factor that really yeah. took time to build. Yeah. And and I, I really love that uh, of the mm -hmm. that era, not so much the gore. Yeah. I mean, this one had this one had the gore came in much later, but it did have the, the creepy effect. Speaking of Evil Dead Trap, it did. It, if you haven't seen it, please see it. It's I endorse this film. Okay. <laughs> My name is Justin yes. and I approve <laughs> this message. Um now if you're if you're moving away from that, you have to like right next to that put Halloween. The original Halloween. Now that one is not 80s, that one's late 70s. I think that's like 78 or 79. Um, but that's what I meant by late 70s, early 80s, you know, that time period. So I would definitely put Halloween on that list. I think they they got busy quick. They let you knew let they let you know what type of movie you were in. Uh, they they had a summer camp feel, but in someone's house, which was pretty easy. I mean, pretty interesting. I, I really love that about the film. Um, I think he took his time and he didn't try to rush anything in the film, but you understood in that first 10 minutes what kind of movie you were watching. It wasn't a mystery. It wasn't a mystery. Um, I think once you once you leave that one, I, I, want to, I want to stay more in the more accessible range. So I would say if, I, if I'm going with what's more accessible, I would then lean towards your, uh, your Hellraisers. I think Hellraiser was very creative for his time. Um, I don't think anybody really kind of got into that aspect yet of making, your, making who would normally be a villain kind of an anti-hero. So I thought that was pretty cool. That was pretty clever. Um, and from there, I jump into to your, your Jasons and your Freddy Kruegers. Yeah. What about the use? And I don't know if this would be horror tropes, but you know, let's say the the late night phone call mm -hmm. and no one's there. Yeah. Like, what what are some of the things that are just tried and true that they always work? It doesn't matter what year this is. Just it it just builds an intrigue. Um, I think that shot from behind, when a person is walking through a house and the camera is drifting behind them, and they stop, and the camera's slowly getting closer. <laughs> Okay. Because you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, I think that always works. And that never gets old. And nobody ever says, well, I, you know, uh, that's tired. Nobody ever says that because it's just the movement of a camera. I think once you get into actions, that's where it gets, you know, kind of tropey. I think when you get into the late night phone call, I think when you get into the, um, oh my gosh, it's so hot, let me take my clothes off. <laughs> and then you see the hand reach in and take the clothes away, and it's like, oh, that's not the killer. That's their friend. You know, it's just like, oh, come on. You know, like a lot of those things, I, I think they get really tropey, but I think the the camera tricks are the things that don't get old. I don't like the jumpy things. I don't really like those so much. Those are boring to me, mainly because I don't jump. 
But um, it, I, I like to be creeped out. I like to end the movie and, and like, oh, should I turn off the light? You know, and I, I want that feeling. You know, uh-huh. um, but I think the whole camera moving behind someone. I love Rosemary's Baby when the camera kind of shifts a little. And you're constantly thinking something's about to happen to her just because the camera moved a little. I like little subtle things like that. I think those are still very effective. They'll never go away. Should something scary happen on page one of a horror film or is it better to wait a little bit? If it fits the story. It's all about what fits the story and what story you're trying to tell. If, um, if you get right to it on page one, hey, bravo. I hope that you don't take your foot off the gas because now you've built up expectation. Because I think you said in the last question that Halloween, they let you know fairly quickly Mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, did they maintain it? It's been a while, sorry. So. Oh yeah, but, but mainly because Halloween wasn't, it wasn't a story about a guy in a mask who was just killing people at random. Like that wasn't the story. Um, It was a story of evil and evil started young. And this kid was full of evil. And so as he, when he grew up and he came home and was like, what is this guy gonna do now? You know, and he was stalking Jamie Lee Curtis character and you always knew, it was that that, that sense of it. Did you ever see, uh, what was that movie? Uh, It Follows. And it was, you know, the girl has sex with the guy and then the evil spirit starts following her and if it catches her, it'll kill her, that sort of thing, right? So the thing about it was it moved slow, but it was always present and it was always closing in. So even if it was far behind, you knew you had to stay that much ahead of it, right? You knew. In this movie, Jamie Lee Curtis didn't know. Only the audience knew that he was closing in on her and he was getting closer and closer and closer. And that's where the the dread came from. That's why in the beginning of the film, when we see him as a kid and we see him, like he's actually going about murdering, you know, his sister and the sister's boyfriend and all that stuff. Um, It was the buildup of this evil that was inside this kid. And he slowly worked his way up to that in those first 10 minutes, right? And then he grew up and now you're watching it play out as an adult. So he he built, he built set the tone for what the rest of the film was gonna be and he didn't really let up. All he did was give you someone to care about in Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Laurie Strode. He gave you somebody to care about. And then he said, now watch me butcher her. And then you were like, you were so worried for her. You were like, please uh, run, hide, he's right there. you know. And I think he did that very, very well. Sure, and it would be the same, I guess, in The Exorcist as well, even though the character wasn't stalking her, it was inside of her, inside and she, of her. Couldn't, she couldn't get it out, mm-hmm. and she couldn't stop it. Yeah, right. you set the tone very early with that one. I mean, they set an eerie tone uh, when they were digging up, they excavating the thing, and it, was, it just felt weird. The musical cues, the, the zooms, all of it felt weird. All of it felt very, very weird. And they kept that feeling throughout. It just kept you off balance. Right. Kept you really off balance. It made your skin crawl a little bit. Right. Yeah. It was great. 